I extol you, Lord, I extol Instruct us, rebuke us, correct us, align us, heal us, deliver us, correct us, discipline us through the preaching and the teaching of your word. Have your way as only you can. Anoint every ear to hear and every heart to receive. 
and anoint my, my lips to speak as an oracle of God. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand of praise. Come on, you can do better than that. Wow. said you know go to two or three people and say happy heritage Sunday but we're not gonna do that social distancing but just look at the person next to you and say happy heritage Sunday and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord hallelujah I want to take this time to welcome you all in the name of Jesus. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to recognize a servant of God in this place together with his lovely wife who has come to fellowship with us, Pastor Mazibugo. Uh, Pastor Mazibugo, stand up, sir, with your wife. Can we give God a big hand? Amen. Uh, Pastor Mazibugo. I'm, I'm saying this publicly. Uh, I know some of you, because of the mask, you can't recognize him. <laughs> uh, Pastor Mazibugo um, is a man of God. Um, he has been part of DLCI before he started his work. And, um, you know, um, so it's good to have you with us, sir. Mama, it's good to have you with us. One more time, let's give the Lord a big hand of appreciation. Amen. Um, do we have any first-time visitors? Um, if you're a first-time visitor, stand. We want to acknowledge and welcome you. Um, no, we don't. Okay. I also would like to take this time to welcome um, all of you, my children, that are coming um, for the first time. Um, since lockdown. It's good to see you. We thank the Lord that he preserved you, that he kept you, that he protected you, and that you are coming back healthy. Can we give God a big hand of appreciation for them? <laughs> Hallelujah. I, well, I want us to, to push from where we've left off last Sunday, um, serving God with a fervent spirit, and this will be a second part, serving God with a, a fervent uh, spirit. Now, I think today I'm going to be able to explain that word, fervency. But let's first of all read the main text, Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Romans chapter 12, verse 11 says, Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. And in the Amplified Version, it reads, Never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor. Be aglow and burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. The New King James Version reads as follows, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, there are three instructions here. The first instruction is that, in fact, there are two. We should not be slothful or slothful in zeal or we should not lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor, the Amplified says. But instead of that, we need to be fervent in spirit as we serve the Lord. So the main aim is in serving the Lord, but Paul is telling us how we need to serve the Lord and how we should not serve the Lord. He, should not, he says we should not be slothful or lazy in zeal. And then he tells us how. He says we should be fervent in spirit. 
So we should serve the Lord with fervency. Now, I said last Sunday that the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the things that, you know, um, really happened amongst many other things, uh, but as it pertains to our spiritual lives, is that it was a test of faith. Our faith was tested. And some of us grew in character. Some of us got to realize that we were not as matured as we thought we were. Some of us, um, you know, our faith, our lack of faith was exposed by the season. And, and, and some of us learned to do certain things. We learned to stand on our own. You know, we learned to trust God. Our faith was stretched. Some of us, our faith grew. Some of us, we began to struggle. The season exposed us. We, we, we began to realize that we were not as matured as we thought we were. And, um, and I must say that in the midst of all that, there are some of us that started to buckle under the pressure of the season that we find ourselves in. We became vulnerable and this, our spiritual temperature began to go down. Maybe some of us started murmuring and complaining. And then we, at the end, we got into a place where we became cold spiritually. And when we became cold spiritually, the new normal, which was enforced on us, the new normal, which was created by the circumstances, which was not going to church in terms of gathering together. And that new normal, the enemy began to take advantage and brought about lethargy in most of us and spiritual apathy began to settle in to the point where, of course, the devil is involved. We now got into a place where we became comfortable and we enjoyed walking, waking up on Sunday without going to church or gathering with the saints. At first, it's something we didn't enjoy. At first, it's something we said, no, we need to pray. You know, uh, the churches must be allowed to gather. But as time went on, um, the enemy used the situation to lull us to spiritual sleep or spiritual slumber. And we got into a place where we accepted the new normal. And we enjoyed the new normal. And even when the opportunity now to go back to church amidst the restrictions when it was given, we still found it hard. Because now, um, you know, spiritually, we were no longer where we used to be. We became apathetic spiritually. And we, we defined apathy or spiritual apathy. Or the word apathy and lethargy is one and the same thing. Apathy, we said, is lack of interest or concern especially regarding the matters of general importance or appeal. It is indifference. Uh, the word apathy means a lack of emotion or interest. And so we slipped into spiritual apathy where we lacked interest on spiritual things, where we lacked interest about church, where we lacked interest about the things of God. Apathy is a state of total disinterest on any matter, especially on future. Apathy is lack of interest, listless condition. It is indifference. Apathy means I don't care. We got into a place where we didn't care anymore whether, we, whether we, we have prayed or not. We didn't care anymore whether we've studied the word or not. We didn't care anymore whether we'll ever go to church or to gather together or not. Now, dictionary.com, Anna Breach, defines apathy as the absence or suppression of passion, emotion, or excitement. So, Apathy, you, you, supp you either suppress or you lose excitement uh, in, in, this, in this context about the things of God. You lose excitement about church. Remember in Psalm 122, David says, I was glad when they said unto me, come let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad, I was excited. And, and you know, um, and so you lose that spark, you lose that zeal, you lose that excitement of, you know, going to the house of the Lord and to connect with the saints and to enjoy corporate worship. And there's a catchphrase that 
you know, we've been running with, many believers have been running with, and the catchphrase says, I'm the church. I don't have to go to church to connect with God. Now, that's a beautiful catchphrase, and it is biblical. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. I listen to what I'm saying. But, but sometimes this catchphrase can be misplaced. It can be used to undermine the need to gather or to congregate. You know, I've been doing a research, I've been doing a study, I've been praying, and, um, you know, I, I will be bringing a message on the congregation of the saints. Because I realize that even the definition of the word church, it means an assembly. There is no church without the gathering. Let me not go ahead of myself. And so, lack of interest. And of course, you know, we've been, you know, um, enjoying services through live streaming and so forth. But not everybody was, you know, was able to, you know, to log in and things like that. But lack, in, you know, apathy means lack of interest in or concerning things that others find moving or exciting. All of a sudden, we lost the excitement about God and the things of God and about the house of the Lord and about serving in the house of the Lord. We lost interest about corporate worship. We lost interest about, you know, corporate prayers and corporate gathering. And we said the word apathy in the Greek describes a state of listlessness or topor of not caring or not being concerned with one's position or condition in the world. It can lead to a state of being unable to perform one's duties in life. Spiritual apathy is a feeling of indifference towards spiritual things. It's a lack of motivation to grow in your walk with God. So some of the synonyms for apathy are impassiveness, indifference, lethargy, boredom, and unconcern. We got to a place where we were no longer concerned about God, concerned about spiritual things. Very simply, you know, another word for apathy is boredom. You know, what is boredom? Very simply put, boredom is disinterest, lack of interest, lack of interest. And so, you know, uh, whilst all these restrictions were put to curb the spread of COVID-19, and it was good, there was nothing else that government could do, in the midst of all that, the enemy infiltrated us, infiltrated the hearts of the people of God to bring them to a place of boredom about the things of God. Now, boredom is disinterest. It's a condition of finding something or someone or some subject or some task or some event or perhaps almost everything uninteresting. All of a sudden, going to church became boring. It became uninteresting. Lack of interest. You know, I've been, I've been serving the Lord since 1986 when I got born again. I can hardly count. Maybe at least it's less than 10 Sundays that I haven't been to church. I'm not talking about DLCI. If I'm away... I would be preaching somewhere around the world or in another church. But I'm talking about staying at home on Sunday and not going to church. I can count less than 10 and not more than 7 times. So, and I'm sure that I know, I know that <laughs> even before, even before um, this pandemic there are people who are struggling with church attendance. You know, there are people. I generally, COVID-19 or no COVID-19, there are people who are struggling with regular church attendance. You know, they are not consistent. But, you know, the pandemic made the issue even worse. But you see, the issue is, the issue is not even the fact that we were restricted from gathering together. The issue here is getting into a place where we enjoyed not gathering together to the point where we even allowed disinterest to come into our hearts. Because now, it's now a tall order when we have to come back and gather. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Because now, 
you know, it's now a tall order. It's now difficult. Boredom is not the opposite of busyness. It is the opposite of interest. Because boredom is not the opposite of busyness, it's the opposite of interest. It's not, it's not a things to do problem. It's an interest problem. So when we speak of apathy as a major problem confronting us as Christians, I'm speaking of lack of interest which many believers show towards spiritual things. Apathy uh, is an attitude of indifference and unconcern towards spiritual things. It's a lack of motivation to grow in your walk with God. So apathy and indifference are kindred words. Actually, they are synonyms. Apathy also means without love. It is the word pathos with a negative. Christians who have lost their zeal have a lost love problem. Remember what, what Jesus said to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 3? He says, you have lost your first love. Now, one definition of lukewarm is serving God in such a way as to not offend the devil. So, apathy and indifference are the major problems facing believers today. You know, we need to reset now. Um, we, we are praying and trusting God that there won't be any resurgence of COVID-19 in our nation. We are looking at post-COVID-19 um, already. And uh, I, I don't know about you, I'm not thinking about any, any time where we would need to go back to lockdown. How many of you can say amen to that? And, and um, when we hit post-COVID-19 season, could it be that, you know, I ask myself a question, how many believers will we have lost to the world? How many believers will come back? How many believers will still be serving God? That's the issue. Now, God wants us to serve him with zeal, passion, and fervency. Now, you see, now the, 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 what necessitates this message, the background is the fact that we are now spiritually lethargic. There is indifference in our lives. Um, we, we are, we, some of us, our spiritual temperature is minus 10 below zero. Spiritually speaking. And, and so we are cold. And in Revelations chapter 3, um, you know, Jesus, writing to the church in Laodicea, he says to that church, he says, you are neither hot nor cold. He says, I would that you were cold, or hot but because you are neither cold nor hot but you are lukewarm I will spew you out of my mouth so God wants us to either to choose to be hot for him or to be cold and not bother serving him at all he says if you are to serve me if you are to have a relationship with me you, you, you become hot don't be lukewarm because you make me vomit he says, look, you can choose to be cold. In other words, if you don't want to serve me, it, it's your own choice. Just be cold. Be cold. You know? But if you want to serve me, be red hot. How do you get lukewarm water? It's when you mix the hot and the cold. He says, I don't want a mixture. I don't want a mixture. So, God wants us to serve him with zeal, with passion. He says, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And we explain, we, we define the word uh, slothful. To be slothful is to be lazy, is to be slow, or to be, lazy, to, be slazy, to be lazy. The word diligence means to be zealous, to put in a very special effort. Okay, so now I want us to start today after having explained the word slothful, I want us to start on the word fervent. Fervent. Remember, it says, do not be slothful in zeal. And that's what we looked at last Sunday. What it means to be slothful in zeal. He says, be fervent in spirit. Be fervent in spirit. So this is the second part. And this is the... The, the, this is where the message is. Be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And we, we will look at this as the last part in the next session. 
It says, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Now, what does it mean to be fervent in, in the spirit? You and I should not be spiritually apathetic. We should not be lethargic. lethargic. We, should not be, we should not lack interest in the things of God. Right? And also, we should not be slothful in zeal. We should not be slacking. We should not be sluggish. We should not be slow. We should not be, you know, um, lazy when it comes to the things of God or to serving God. That's not the way to serve God, Paul says. He says, don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. So what does it mean to be fervent in the spirit? The title of the message is serving God with a fervent spirit. Now, to be fervent in spirit is the opposite of being slothful in zeal. The word translated fervent in spirit means to boil with heat. It means to be hot or to add low. To boil with heat. To be hot or to add low. It is used of boiling anger, love, and zeal for what is good or bad. Sometimes the word is used negatively when it talks about anger, but positively when it talks about love and zeal for what is good. The dictionary's definition is very similar. The word fervent is having or showing great emotion or warmth, passionate, ardent, extremely hot, glowing. This is, this is the attitude with which we are to serve the Lord. Now, as used in our text, it means to have a burning zeal to do the will of God. To have a burning zeal to do the will of God. To be fervent... In spirit means to be spiritually boiling, bubbling over due to high heat, seething with energy and passion. The alternative to slothfulness in zeal isn't doing a bunch of stuff. It is growing spiritually hot. That means to be red hot. That's what that word fervent means. So Paul says, do not be slothful in zeal. Do not be lazy. Do not be sluggish in zeal. You must be diligent. And he says, be fervent in spirit. Be red hot in the things of God. Be red hot in your work with God. Be red hot in your service to the Lord. Be red hot in your relationship with God. In other words, be on fire for God. Be on fire. Serve God with a wholehearted devotion, not half-heartedly. Not as if you are doing God a favor. Not as if you are being pushed. You know, not as if you are doing someone, your pastor, a favor. Whatever you do, whether you serve in the church, whether you worship, whether you are in the ministry of helps, whether you come to church, whether you pray, whatever you do, do it with fervency. Be boiling. So there's no room for half-hearted devotions. In other words, whatever you do, do it with all of your heart. So that is what it means to be fervent. Now, for an, if you put a pan of water on the stove, then at first it is motionless, right? But once the heat gets at it underneath, then it begins to boil. It comes alive, as it were. So it is with being a glow. It is a figurative language of a fire. The fire gives off heat. There is life in it. Thus we are to be fervent in spirit. Paul is talking about feeling sluggish in your relationship with God. He's describing a feeling of laziness and lack of desire when he talks about slothfulness. When he says, do not be slothful in zeal, Paul is talking about the feeling of your sluggish in your relationship with God, in your walk with God. He's describing a feeling of laziness and a lack of desire. He says, that's not how to serve God. He says, be fervent in spirit. Be red hot. Serve God with a fervent spirit. Serve God with passion. Be zealous. For the things of God. 
He's describing a holy zeal or passion for God that believers should have for God and his kingdom. So to be fervent is to be passionate, engaged, committed, active, energetic, and motivated. Have you ever seen Abba Zalwan? Please, Bazalwane, come to the prayer meeting. Bazalwane, please come early in church. Please. Bazalwane, please don't stay away from church. Bazalwane, please pay your tithe. Please give, Bazalwane. Bazalwane, please have a personal prayer life. Bazalwane, please read your Bible. Bazalwane, please live a holy life for God. Please, Bazalwane, please. You almost have to beg believers to pray, beg them to give, beg them to come to church, beg them to do everything for God, beg them to love God. Why? Because they are sluggish, they are slothful, they are lazy. But Paul says that's not how to serve the Lord. He says you need to be boiling for the Lord. You need to be passionate. You need to serve God with a wholehearted devotion. When you are boiling for God, nobody tells you it's the prayer meeting. It's time for prayer. When you are boiling for God, nobody tells you you need to come to church. When you are boiling for God, nobody tells you to pay your tithe. When you are boiling for God, nobody tells you to love the Lord. Nobody tells you to stay away from sin. Nobody tells you because you are red hot for him. But why is it that we have so many wheelbarrow Christians. You know a wheelbarrow, when you push it, wherever you drop it, if you leave it there for 10 days, it will just be there. A wheelbarrow will go as far as you push it. So many believers. Why is it that pastoring uh, is also is seen as the third most risky jobs in the world? Do you know, did you know that? Pastoring is regarded as the third most risky jobs in the world. You see, the problem with believers, they think that, you know, when you become a pastor, all you are concerned about is to preach and get the, the, the offering. No, it's a calling. It's not a job, it's a calling. You, you carry a burden for people. You read the book of Numbers, Numbers 11, where Moses said to the Lord, look, Lord, I'm not able to carry the burden of these people. I'm better off dead than alive. I can't carry the burden of these people alone. Ministry is a burden you carry. It's a heavy burden. It's hard work. And, and, and one of the reasons why most pastors, um, I don't know the latest stats now, but it was said recently that in America, 3,000 pastors are resigning the pastorate every month. Because of the pressure, because of the weight, because of the burden of, of the pastoral ministry. And so, watch this. When a pastor leaves his career or her career or her, their business or what they were doing to answer the call of God, to pick up a burden for a particular people. And then they fast and they pray and they burn the midnight oil and they prepare a sermon and they prepare a message for God's people, to bless God's people. And God's people don't show up. It affects the pastor. It affects the pastor. It's not the issue, no, no, if I come to church, I've come to church. What is his problem? <laughs> it affects him because that's the calling. So you carry a burden, and that burden can kill you. That's why a lot of pastors die with heart-related diseases or conditions. Most pastors, if you, if you do a research. See, your names are not 
in the database of the church only. I carry you in my heart, like Paul says. I have you in my heart, and whatever happens to you affects the pastor. It is a burden. Sometimes that burden brings about frustration. Why am I saying this? When you constantly teach the people to obey God, to do the word of God, and you have to push them to pray, you have to push them to give, you have to push them to come to church, you have to push them to read the Bible, you have to push them to have their own prayer life, it's very taxing. And why should we push people? Because spiritually, they are cold. Some are lukewarm. So we are trying to motivate people who have lost the fire. But watch this. If you are boiling in your spirit for God, you are making the job even easier for us. Because nobody has to tell you to pray. Nobody has to tell you to give. Nobody has to tell you to live a holy life. Nobody has to tell you to come to church. You know why? Even when you serve, even when you serve in your department, you do it wholeheartedly. Because you are boiling, you are red hot. It is an intrinsic motivation. You don't need an outside motivation. You are intrinsically motivated because the fire is burning in the inside of you. I've been there. I know when I remember when we started a church in Alexander, there was <laughs> a keyboard prayer that we had in Funis Mazubu. I would drive from Tembisa, arrive in Alexander, set up the place, and then sit to Upi, but Upi's banda, but he's not here. And I would have to drive again. Emma 18, Nyom Vusa. And then he would take his bath, then he would come to church and play. We would have to start all over again because Abba Zalwana will say we didn't hear the keyboard. So we'll have to start all over again. You know there are Christians like that. You have to beg them. Please, please uh, go and sing. Please, please go and play the instruments. Please, please don't leave. Please go and usher. Please do this. You know, those Christians are slothful, they are sluggish, they, have, they lack zeal in their relationship with God. But believers that are fervent, you don't have to tell them they are intrinsically motivated. So to be fervent is to be passionate, engaged, committed, active, energetic, motivated. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. How passionate are you right now about God and the things of God? How passionate are you? Do you still have your passion? Are you still passionate about God? Are you still red hot in your relationship with God? Do you still have the passion? Or is the passion gone? Do you still have the fire? Or is the fire gone? You know, let me just say something. You know, I will throw things here and there, but it will come as a, as, as, as a, as a series on the power of the gathering of the saints. Remember the illustration I gave you last Sunday, that hot coals burn together brightly. When you put hot coals together, they bend together brightly. But if you separate the coals, what will happen to those coals? They will go off. So, this is, this is what happens when we cease to fellowship, when we cease to gather, when we don't gather together. There is power in fellowship. There is power in fellowship. You see, people, sometimes people, they run with a truth. 
without balancing it with the other truths. Oh no, I'm the church. I can talk to God alone. I can, you know, watch TV at home. I can, well, there's a place for that. But that should not replace the need to congregate. Because there are certain things that you cannot do outside of the congregation of the saints. For an example, the Bible says we must love one another. There are a lot of the one another's in the scriptures. And those one another's can only find expression in the gathering of the saints. Encourage one another. Provoke one another into good works. How do you provoke one another into good works when you are scattered? Yes, we are a church when we are scattered, but we are a church when we are gathered. And there are times where we are scattered circumstantially. There are times where we are scattered because that's how things should be. For an example, we are a church gathered right now, you know, and then after the service will be a church scattered. We are still the church. So there is the aspect of the church gathered and the aspect of the church scattered. And the church scattered does not replace the need for the church gathered. And the church gathered should not discount the church scattered. For an example, we are a church gathered right now to receive instructions, to receive the word of the Lord, amongst other things, for corporate prayer, for corporate worship. But after the service, we need to be the church scattered into the marketplace where we transform the spheres of society that God has called us into. The church is a training center. It is not a prison house where you lock up people. It's a training center where people come in, they, they gather, they are equipped, they are trained, they are empowered, and then they are released to go out into the marketplace and make the difference. Take the anointing to the street. Take the anointing to your workplace. Take the anointing everywhere. So, there is the aspect of the church scattered and the aspect of the church gathered. So, and we need both. And so we can never um, use, you know, the fact that due to restrictions, we were not able to gather, and we cannot now use that to discount or to discredit the need for gathering. For an example, in, in the book of Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about church discipline. And he says, when you meet out church, when you gather together. So church discipline is administered in the gathering of the saints, not in isolation. So there are so many passages of scripture in the Bible that would be irrelevant, that would not make sense if you, you take away the gathering of the saints. It's important. It's important. Now, we need to be on fire for God. We need to serve God with spiritual fervency. Let's turn to Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. So Paul is describing a holy zeal or passion for God and his kingdom purposes. We need to be on fire. We need to serve God with passion. We need to be on fire for God. Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. I read verse 13. Now behold, this is the road to Emmaus. Now behold, two, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and risen that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are said? Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened uh, there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed and word before God and all people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we're hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. 
Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that he had also, uh, he, he also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Verse 28. Then they drew near to the village where they were going and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him saying, Abide with us for it is towards evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Verse 31. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Verse 32, and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, so they, are, they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and now he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Verse 32 is, my, is the key, is the key is, that's the verse I want us to look at. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? Did not our heart burn with us? Now, let me quickly give us the context of this passage. It was the afternoon of Resurrection Sunday. These disciples were on their way to, to the small town of Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And we see this in verse 32 says in Luke 24, it says, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Now, remember, these people did not know that they were walking with Jesus. They were recounting what had happened. They didn't know that this was indeed Jesus that they were talking to. That is why in verse 25, it says, Then he said to them, All foolish ones, and slow to heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then also, he broke bread um, with them, and their eyes were open. And they, they realized that indeed this was the Messiah. And then they, they recounted, and they, say, and they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? The issue is, what is a burning heart? They said, our hearts burned burned in us. What is a burning heart? Remember, we are talking about serving God with a fervent spirit. What is a burning heart? A descriptive term for a new renewed devotion to the Lord. A burning heart is a descriptive term for a new or renewed devotion to the Lord. It is the opposite of a cold heart. It is the opposite of a cold heart. You see, a cold heart is lethargic. A cold heart is apathetic. As a cold heart lacks interest for spiritual things. It lacks interest for God. A cold heart does not care about God. A cold heart is an indifferent heart. A cold heart is slothful in zeal. It's lazy. It's sluggish. But a heart that is burning, that is red hot, is a heart with a renewed devotion to the Lord. It is the opposite of the cold heart. So an appropriate definition of a burning heart would be a heart on fire for God because of his presence. So when they said, and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us? Their hearts were on fire when Jesus spoke to them. 
They were on fire. They had traveled a day's journey from Jerusalem and had stopped for the night, had supper, and were making ready for the evening slumber. When Jesus broke bread and gave it to them, their eyes were open and they recognized him. Perhaps it was the scars in his hand or the way he prayed, but there was now no question about his identity. At that very moment, he vanished from their sight and they began to discuss what has just happened to them. They couldn't sleep now. They had to go and tell other disciples what they had just experienced. From that encounter, when their hearts burned, from that encounter that they had with him, they couldn't just sit still. They had to go and tell the other disciples. This was, this was night and they were seven miles from Jerusalem. But that made a little difference to them. You see, when our hearts burn within us, the presence and reality of God, we won't be able to keep it to ourselves or act casually about it. We will not only want to, but we will have to share it with someone else. You remember the woman at the well? That Samaritan woman. After the encounter with Jesus, she left her jar, her water pot, and she ran to the city. Jesus did not send her. Jesus did not send her. She ran to the city. She says, come and meet a man who told me everything that I've ever done. That's what happened when you encounter you, you know, when you have an encounter with God, when your spirit is red hot, when your spirit is burning, you remember the day when you first got born again. You remember when you first came to Jesus. You had not been to any theological school. You had not been to Bible college. You did not know much of the Bible, but you didn't keep quiet. You told people, this is, I, I don't know the Bible, but this is how I used to be, and this is how Jesus has changed my life. Do you remember? Do you remember how passionate you were? Do you remember that you will prepare your clothes on Wednesday. You couldn't wait for Sunday. You couldn't wait to, to congregate with the saints. You couldn't wait to hear the word of God. You couldn't wait to worship with the saints. You couldn't wait to give. You couldn't wait to hear the preaching and the teaching of the word. What happened? You were burning. You were on fire for God. But fast forward five years later, ten years later, fifteen years later, life happens. And what's happening now? You are apathetic. You've lost the zeal. You've lost the fire. You are now slothful. You are no longer running into the house of the Lord. You have to be dragged to the house of the Lord. You, you have lost the zeal. You are sluggish. You are lazy. You are slothful. The fire is gone. But you see, the good news that I have to you today is that the fire can be rekindled. The fire can be revived. That fire can be revived. Somebody say, Amen. That fire can be revived. We need revival, renewal, and restoration. You know, oftentimes we think revival is to the world. No, 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 no. Revival is not to the world. Revival is to the church. The word revival means to bring back to life something that was once alive and is now dead or about to die. You remember when the fire is burning, when the fire is about to die out, what do you do with the logs of wood? You rekindle the fire. You revive the fire. Revival is to the church. The unsaved don't need revival. They need a resurrection because they are dead in their trespasses and sins. It is the church that needs revival. Why? Because many of us, the fire has died down. The spark is gone. We are now cold. What do we need? We need to be revived. We need renewal. We need restoration. The restoration of passion, the restoration of zeal. We need to be shaken out of spiritual lethargy and apathy. And we need to have the fire rekindled again. You know why? Because God says, don't be slothful. Don't be sluggish. Don't be lazy in serving me. The only person, the only way I want to be served is passionately. The only way I want to be served is with fire. Our spirit is to boil over as we serve the Lord. The message captures the essence of this verse nicely. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master. Paul says, serve the Lord with fervency. Paul isn't describing someone who needs to be arm-twisted 
into volunteering for some ministry until finally he feels guilty and can't figure a way out. So he grudgingly says, okay. Rather, he's describing those who are boiling over with zeal to the point that they probably need to be counseled to focus their efforts because their tendency will be to get involved in just about every opportunity to serve the Lord that comes along. You know, when people are boiling with fire, you know, let's look at this volunteerism in church. I've just come to realize, and we'll talk about this next Sunday, that we don't need volunteers in church. You know, volunteers have a choice. Volunteers can appear as and when they are available. We need servants. We need servants of God. Because the volunteering mentality is the mentality that acts as if I'm doing the church a favor, I'm doing the pastor a favor. You see, this thinking, I'm not called. They are called. I'm not a pastor. You know, he's the pastor. They are called. And so, anything I do in church, they must understand. I can only do it if I have time. If I don't have time, I don't have to do it. So, I've paid my tithe. I've given my offering. So what? No. You've gotten it all wrong. Thank God for paying your tithe and for giving your offering. But that's not all. You are gifted to serve. You are gifted to serve the body. You are gifted to serve God by serving the body. You are to serve God. And so, the volunteer mentality is the mentality that causes us pastors to beg. Oh, please. Please be available. Oh, please. It makes us to be vulnerable for manipulation. We can get easily manipulated. Because you have to beg people. You have to beg people in church. You have to beg people to come to church. And, but believers have somehow gotten used to thinking that if I go to church, I make the pastor feel good. I'm doing this for pastor. No. It is your covenant responsibility to serve God, not as a volunteer, but as a slave. I'll show you next Sunday. A servant. Let me ask you a question. Who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says we belong to God. He purchased us with his own blood. And because we belong to God, we are his property. Am I right? Am I correct? We are his property. To serve him. You know, sometimes when we talk, you hear a person say, this is my life. It's my life. Really? Let me ask you a question. How many of you have given your life to the Lord? You've given your life to the Lord. So which life are you talking about? If you have given it away, then it is no longer yours. That simply means that you no longer make your own, you know, you, 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 no, you no longer live as you please. You live according to his will. You are surrendered to your master. You are owned by God, your master. You do the will of your master. It is not as you will, but as he wills. And the life, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life that I live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God. He says, I have no life. I've been crucified. I'm dead. The life that I live, I live by faith in the son of God. You and I have no life. We've given it away. And the life that we live, we live by faith in the Son of God. And we, we have no life. We've given it to the Lord. To live this life in service to him. When it comes, you know, when it comes to helping me on my personal capacity, maybe you can volunteer. 
But when it comes to the work of the Lord, how can you volunteer to your owner? And so sometimes, because we have this volunteering mentality, we give a half-hearted devotion. And sometimes, you know, believers, when they want to deal with you, as a pastor, Pastor Mazibu, when they want to deal with you, they withhold their service. We want to deal with them. The, forgetting that even the pastor is a fellow slave. He may be the chief slave, but he's a fellow slave. God is the master. And so they are not dealing with you. They are dealing with their master. Because this is not my church. This is God's church. Now, as I prepare to, to close, let's look at some biblical examples. See, the Christian life is one of heart passion. Is Kaya here? To the piano. The Christian life is one of heart passion. Doing and efficiency are not crucial. Feeling fervency, boiling in spirit, that is what matters. Now, here are some biblical examples of those who are fervent or zealous for God. There are great prophets who were zealous for God in the Bible. The great prophets of God were zealous for him. For an example, Elijah in 1 Kings 19 verse 10. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts. So Elijah served God with a fervent spirit with zeal and with passion. And then we see King Jehu. King Jehu said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Second Kings chapter 10, verse 16. And of course, the primary example in the New Testament of someone who served with zeal is Jesus. Our Lord Jesus burned with zeal to serve God. It must be noted that zeal, that the zeal Christ manifested was a fulfillment of an Old Testament scripture. In Psalm 69 verse 9, the Bible says, zeal for your house has consumed me. And then in Psalms 119 verses 139, the Bible says, my zeal consumes me. Then Isaiah 9 verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and of the peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this so th these are scriptures in the Old Testament talking about Jesus now speaking of him in John 2 verse 17 that is speaking of Jesus the Bible says then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So Jesus served God out of a zealous, passionate heart. He served God out of a zealous, passionate heart. Jesus' passion was his father's will. He said in John 4, 34, he says, Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus served his father with great zeal and passion. He was not slothful. He was not sluggish. He was not lazy. And then another New Testament example is Apollos. Apollos is another example of zeal. In Acts 18, verses 24 through 26, the Bible says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, came to Ephesus and being fervent in spirit he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord and when Priscilla and Aquila heard him speaking boldly in the temple they took him aside and taught him the, the scripture says expounded the way of God more perfectly Apollos was apparently not arrogant or vain in his preaching but was truly he had truly had a fervent spirit because he was not offended at being taught the truth more extensively. So, Apollos was very fervent in spirit 
but there are certain things that he still needed to be taught and Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and they helped him and expounded some scriptures to him and he took it in a good spirit Apollos was apparently not arrogant or vain in his preaching but was truly fervent in spirit because he was not offended at being taught the truth more extensively as eloquent as he was he must have truly loved the Lord and had an intense desire to learn he accepted what he was taught verse 28 says for he Apollos mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ so how wonderful it is to know that those in the early church spoke so boldly for our Lord Apollos is only one example of many who were fervent in spirit he was fervent you know he he ministered with a wholehearted devotion both Jesus and Apollos were successful in accomplishing their God-given task because they were fervent in spirit. The fourth example is the Corinthian believers. The Bible says they were zealous. The Corinthian Christian zeal had provoked very many in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2. Now, in closing, let me close it by bringing, tying it and bringing it to us. We must also be zealous for God. We must be on fire for God. Psalm 69 verse 9, For the zeal of your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Has the zeal of God's house consumed you? The zeal of God's house. Has it consumed you to the point where you say, I've got to go to church? I can't stay away from church. I understand when there were restrictions. But now that the restrictions are eased, are you consumed with the zeal? Even when the restrictions, we were still under restrictions to gather. Was that zeal burning and pushing you to the point where you were praying and looking forward for the day where we would be able to gather again? For zeal for your house has consumed you. Do you still have the zeal for the house of God? Or have you lost the zeal? Have you lost the spark? It says, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Notice when you are zealous, you will receive insults. You will not be popular. You will be called a fanatic. You will be called a slave. Why are you so serving? Why are you in church every time? Why are you allowing your pastor to make you a slave? You know, people will say all kinds of things. Now, scriptures not only want us to be obedient followers of Christ, but also to experience passion and desire to follow Christ. In the vernacular, we could say that we are to be on fire for Jesus. Hebrews 6 verse 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That ye be not slothful. That word slothful again. That ye be not slothful. Ye be not sluggish. Ye be not slow. Ye be not lazy. The ASV translation read. So that you, know not, you may not be sluggish. But imitators of those who through faith with patience inherit the promises. We are not to become sluggish. What does the word sluggish mean? It means displaying little movement or activity. It means slow. It means inactive. For an example, we talk about a sluggish stream. Or we talk about sluggish growth. The Bible says we should not be sluggish. Sluggish means to display little movement or activity. You know, is there any little movement or activity in your spiritual life? In your walk with God? Is there any little, any activity? Are you slow? Are you inactive in church? Are you inactive? Are you using your gift? What are you doing to serve the Lord? Secondly, it means lacking alertness, vigor, or energy. In at or indolent, it means to be lazy. You lack alertness. Are you spiritually alert? Do you have vigor? Do you, do you have energy in the house of the Lord? Are you energetic? Sluggish. Hallelujah. When we worship, Hallelujah, 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 
sluggish. Tell your neighbor Jesus is here. Jesus is here. No life. Slow, sluggish, inactive. You lack energy. You lack zeal. You are not alive. It is as if you are a prisoner. They just, you know, you wonder, why did she come to church? Why did he come to church? No excitement, no joy. It also means slow to perform or respond to stimulation. Slow to perform. Very slow people. Slow to respond. I will do it. I will do it. I'm supposed to do that. I will do it. I will do it. Slow to perform or respond to stimulation. The spiritually sluggish, the Bible says, do not inherit the promises of God. We are not to be sluggish, slothful, or lazy in serving the Lord, but we are to be fervent, to boil with heat, to be hot in serving the Lord. We are to show earnestness and not be sluggish, slothful, or lazy in our faith and perseverance. Are you slow and inactive towards God? Or are you on fire in your faith and service to God? Or does it really matter to you? Or it doesn't matter? French military strategist Ferdinand Fogg said, The most powerful weapon on earth is the human soul on fire. The most powerful weapon on earth is the human soul on fire. Fire on the inside affects everything on the outside. If you, have, if you are on fire for God, or if you are on fire for any cause, then you can pay any price. Don't be indifferent about the Lord and his cause. Be fervent in spirit. You may say, but I'm just not that type. I'm too laid back to be fervent in spirit as you are describing but this is not a matter of personality types. Paul writes this to the whole church in Rome. It applies to every personality type. It applies to both young people and old people alike. It's a matter of passion, of what gets you excited, no matter what your personality type or some things you get excited. Fervor and enthusiasm are the keys to success in the work of the Lord. I want to close now. Fever and enthusiasm are the keys to success in the work of the Lord. If there's anything that catches people's attention and causes them to sit up and take notice of what you are saying or doing, it's enthusiasm. We need to be enthusiastic for God. We need to serve the Lord with passion, zeal, and enthusiasm. What is the meaning of enthusiasm? The word enthusiasm is derived from two Greek words. The words en, which means in, and theos, which means God. So enthusiasm literally means in God or God in us. Thus, the truly enthusiastic person is one who acts and speaks as if he were possessed by God. When you are possessed by God, God in us by the Holy Spirit. You become enthusiastic because the life of God is in you. The fire of God is in you. The Holy Ghost is in you. So you become enthusiastic. If we are fervent in spirit and in the service of our Lord, we are to be on fire for him. We are to glow in the spirit of his love and we are to be earnest in our commitment. We are to be fervent in the way we love the Lord. What does the Bible say? You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your might. You are to love the Lord passionately with your entire being. Love the Lord, not you know, half-heartedly. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your might. Love him passionately. Love him with passion. Don't hold back. Don't hold anything back. Because you love him, give your wholehearted devotion to him. Give yourself wholeheartedly. Unfortunately, it seems impossible to move some Christians to actions. The fire and enthusiasm of the first century church is missing of the creation of God. I know thy works. 
that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Let's stand on our feet. Just want to take three minutes to pray. When I remember what the Lord has done, I will never go back anymore. When I remember what the Lord has done, I will never go back anymore when I remember what the Lord when remember what the Lord has done I will never go back anymore when I I will never go back anymore. No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. I will never go back anymore. to this message by going back to the Lord in Psalm 85 verse 6 in the NIV it says will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you the New Living Translation says won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you will you not revive us again that word again means he has done it before and he can do it again I don't know where you are at spiritually I only know where I'm at have you slipped into spiritual leth lethargy have you slipped into spiritual apathy have you grown cold have you become disinterested on the things of God? Have you lost interest? Are you passionate about God or are you now dragging yourself to church? Are you serving out of zeal or out of compulsion? As you take stock of your spiritual life, where are you with God? I want you to begin to pray and say, Lord, I'm coming to you this morning. If you have to repent, acknowledge before God, Lord, I'm spiritually lethargic. Lord, I'm spiritually cold. Let's begin to talk to the Lord. Before we ask him to revive us, let's acknowledge our need for revival. And we acknowledge our need by telling him, by acknowledging 
our spiritual state. Not that he doesn't know, but you know, confession is agreeing with him. He wants us to agree with him. Open your mouth and begin to talk to the Lord right now. Ask God to forgive you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, Lord, as your children. Lord, we know that we need to serve you with fervency. Lord, we acknowledge the slothfulness in our lives. We acknowledge that we are sluggish. We acknowledge, Father God, that we are lukewarm. We acknowledge, Father God, that we have lost the fire, that we have lost the zeal. We acknowledge, Father God, that, Lord, we are inactive, that we are sluggish, that we are slow to perform or to respond to stimulation. We acknowledge, Father God, that we have become lazy. We acknowledge, Father God, that, Lord, we have been half-hearted in our devotion to you. We acknowledge, Father God, that we have been more, as it were, wheelbarrow Christians. We want to be pushed. We acknowledge, Father, that we've lost the fire. We acknowledge, Father, that we are lukewarm. We acknowledge, Father, that we are cold. We acknowledge, Father, that we are backslidden in our hearts. We acknowledge, Father, that we need your grace and we need your mercy. And we are asking you, Lord, to forgive us. We are asking you, Lord, to cleanse us. We are asking you, Lord, to wash us with your blood. We are asking you, Lord, Lord, to cleanse us with your blood. And we repent, Father God, from sin of indifference. We repent, Father, from spiritual apathy. We, we repent from lukewarmness. We, we repent, Father God, from indifference. We repent, Father God, from being lethargic spiritually. We repent and we ask, oh God, for your cleansing. We ask that you wash us, that you cleanse us by your blood. Amangede saka, zenge braka baba sombre kete kasaya, li baba yando robobo sakataya, nenge baraba sondo robo koti kabasaya. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Revive us again so that your people may rejoice. This was the prayer of the psalmist. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Revive us again. To revive is to bring back to life something that was once alive but it's now dead or it's about to die. Will you revive us again? Will you revive us spiritually? Will you revive our spiritual discipline? Will you revive our hunger and desire for church? Will you revive our hunger and desire for worship? Will you revive the hunger and desire to obey your word? The hunger and the desire for your word. Will you revive us again so that your people may rejoice? Notice that revival, a revived soul is a rejoicing soul. And the reason why some of us, we've lost the joy of the Lord is because we need spiritual renewal and revival. It is when you are revived that you will rejoice. And so, I want us to begin to pray. Pray after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge my backslidden state. I acknowledge that spiritually I'm apathetic. I am lethargic. I am cold. I am lukewarm. I acknowledge that I need revival. My prayer life needs revival. My relationship with you needs revival. My life of worship needs revival. I need to be revived, to desire to come to church, to desire to pray, to desire to give, to desire to pay my tithes. To desire to congregate oh God will you not revive me again so that I may rejoice in you I like your joy I need your joy back oh God today by your life-giving spirit by your quickening spirit revive me oh God Release your fire right now in my heart to bring back to life things in my life that have died in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and begin to pray. 
makatora baba sanda jingili abaka sombra kadai manda rababa sika la bayando robobokuti ribaba kanda rababa sanda rababa sendi ribaba sanda rababa sando rebekete mangamba raborogo dongamba ndarabagada hiba ya gado rebegede garobo gorogo de gabaraganda will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice makato rebekete maragade ya maragade ya magada not restore back the hunger in our hearts for you for your word oh god restore the hunger for corporate gatherings restore the hunger for prayer restore the hunger for the word of god restore the hunger for spiritual disciplines makato rebeke kabaya rebeke sukuria ganda mingia baba sanda let every good thing that has died in our lives receive resurrection power 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 in the name of jesus in the name of jesus aka lembre gado seke baraganda lebre magado kosikata oh god restore back the desire restore back the interest for the things of god restore back the zeal for the things of god restore back the desire to pray the desire for the house of the lord the zeal for the house of the lord reka mandoro bokoshikata zenge baba rabagundo robokosia maka paraba sombre gedesia marabonde rebebesinda rababakata rababaka sombre kedesia Rabaka songre ke baba kasanda rekaka sende shinga rababa sanda in jesus name we have prayed let's give god a big hand of appreciation shall we do that come on you can do better than that